Ei, chema, că am aruat pe franteză simicica. Mă prescă, să-i împărni să cam. Come on, man. Did we get it? <laughs> the fuck do you mean, maybe? Yo, 300 fucking million. God damn, 300 million! <laughs> oh, I really hit the big time. Hell yes! Well, did Ralph check him? Yeah, it all seems fine. Hmm. Well, how are they 50 million cheaper than the other bidders? Look. We only have 24 months left, then the money dries up. Who knows who the next president will be? All right. Well, we gotta send some opportunities to the small fish anyway. Albania is a good case study in how abrupt regime change and rapid global political developments can almost instantly increase the value of a country's arms. It also shows what happens when these stockpiles re-enter the global arms market and how this can impact people's lives around the world. Enver Hoxha, the Albanian dictator, ruled the country for over 40 years until 1985. He was obsessed with security. He oversaw the construction of 700,000 bunkers throughout the country and amassed huge stockpiles of weapons from Soviet Russia and then China. Hoxha turned a tiny country of only 3 million people into one of the largest per capita arms depots of the Cold War. During the turbulent 1990s, Albania transformed into a country driven by corruption and shady politics. It descended into anarchy in 1997 when a series of financial pyramid schemes collapsed. Unsecured arms depots were looted and stolen arms reappeared within criminal networks there and abroad. This forced the UN and NATO to negotiate a nationwide decommissioning process. Nevertheless, in the years to follow, Albanian weapons ended up in, or were sold to, some of the worst conflict hotspots in the world. They appeared in Rwanda in the year before that country's brutal genocide. In 2005, Albanian arms also ended up in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and in the period from 2005 to 2006 in Sudan, despite the civil war taking place there. Albania also directly sold weapons to Israel during the 2009 Gaza incursion and to countries such as Armenia, Georgia, and Iran. In 2007, the Albanian Minister of Defense issued an order that allowed an old tank factory to be turned into an ammunition decommissioning and processing plant. This factory was based in the densely populated village of Geradets, located near the capital city of Tirana and its international airport. During the administration of George W. Bush, U.S. private military contracts soared from $145 billion in 2001 to $390 billion in 2008. Under these circumstances, even small businesses, companies like AEY Incorporated, were guaranteed a share of the lucrative arms deals. In 2004, the 19-year-old Efraim Diveroli took over AEY Incorporated, a dormant company registered by his father years earlier. Diveroli's idea was simple, win as many Defense Department contracts as possible. AEY started small, winning contracts for helmets and ammunition. This brought significant income, reportedly nearly two million US dollars, but more importantly, it provided a record of good performance for the Pentagon. On July 28, 2006, the Army Sustainment Command in Rock Island, Illinois, posted a 44-page document titled, A Solicitation for Non-Standard Ammunition. The advert was for the provision of ammunition to the Afghanistan National Army, part of the Bush administration's semi-covert attempts to prop up the new military force. This was one of the cases where the Pentagon issued what is known as a pseudo case, a solicitation that permitted it to allocate defense funds without the approval of Congress. AEY Incorporated won the contract, beating out much larger players. One important caveat was that U.S. citizens were not allowed to trade in Chinese ammunition or weaponry. 
After frantic research and dead-end deals with Czech and Hungarian players, AEY Incorporated negotiated a deal with Albania. Albania was represented by a shell company registered in Cyprus, but operating from Switzerland. The work in Geradet started in April 2007 and accelerated very quickly, with one obstacle. Most of the ammunition was of Chinese origin. AEY decided simply to repackage the ammunition and scrape off anything that suggested it was made in China. None of the employees of the Geradets decommissioning facility received social security or health insurance. In the summer, through to October 2007, Geradets workers dismantled about 60 million bullets. The ammo was removed from decades-old crates, washed, repackaged, and dispatched to Afghanistan. Old gunpowder and other debris was simply dumped on the edge of the factory in a massive pile. Tens of millions of bullets were also repackaged into new boxes. In late 2007, the government granted permission for the factory to dismantle large caliber ammunition. In January of 2008, the first 55 tons of large caliber shells arrived at the factory. By mid-March, 8,900 tons of ammunition had been delivered to the site, brought in by a 24-hour stream of military vehicles. One-tenth of the entire ammunition arsenal of the Albanian armed forces was dumped at Geradets. The workers were instructed to dump old gunpowder, damaged cases, thousands of fuses, and projectiles into a huge pile of deadly debris on the property. All that was needed was a spark. It arrived on the morning of March 15, 2008. In the explosion that resulted, Geradets was almost entirely destroyed. At the end of 2007, Kosta Trebitska, a whistleblower who was initially contracted by AEY, provided revealing documents about the case to Nick Wood, a New York Times journalist based in Tirana. He also contacted the defense ministry in Tirana. Shortly after seeking to cover his tracks, the Albanian Minister of Defense visited the U.S. Ambassador and Military Attaché for advice. Witnesses present at the meeting in the U.S. Embassy in November 2007 said that the Albanian defense minister was concerned that the New York Times reporter would reveal that he had been accused of profiting from selling arms. The ambassador denied the allegations, claiming that all he did was to advise the Ministry of Defense to issue a denial when any article was written. In the explosions, which continued until 2 a.m. the following day and were heard more than 100 miles away, a three-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a pregnant woman were among the 24 people killed. Over 300 people were injured, 318 houses were completely destroyed, and almost 400 others were damaged. Efraim Diveroli pleaded guilty in 2009 to a single conspiracy count and was sentenced to four years in jail. However, Miami federal prosecutors allowed the return of $4.2 million of Diveroli's property, including a new Mercedes S550 that had been confiscated. Diveroli's story is back in the mass media with a book published and a comedy film, War Dogs. Diveroli's partner, David Pacuz, agreed to cooperate with prosecutors and was sentenced to seven months of house arrest. No one in the U.S. government has been charged in the case, even though, as Rolling Stone magazine has suggested, officials in both the Pentagon and the State Department knew that AEY was shipping Chinese-made ammunition to Afghanistan. The Bush administration's push to outsource its wars sent companies like AEY into the world of illegal arms dealing. But when things turned nasty, the government reacted with righteous indignation. No legal action has been taken in Albania against any of the senior politicians involved in the events that led to the deaths of the villagers. The community of Geradets are now attempting to take their case to the European Court for Human Rights. The body of the whistleblower, Kosta Trebitska, was found near Korcha. He appeared to have died in a car accident, but contradictory evidence surfaced to cast doubt on this claim. The case has never been resolved. You may think that the case of AEY Incorporated and the destruction of Geradets is a crazy anomaly in world politics. In reality, it exemplifies just how much is wrong with the global arms industry and how the industry relies on a series of interrelated myths to continue getting away with disasters like Geradets. These myths include the claim that higher defense spending creates more security. 
that the industry can control where the arms it makes and sells end up. That corruption is a problem that only affects banana republics and tin pot dictatorships. And that defense spending and production is good for national economies. These claims are thoroughly debunked in our report, Indefensible, the myths that sustain a bloated, corrupt, and dangerous global arms business.